Have you ever stood in front of the majestic temples of Angkor Wat or Bayan and wondered, how on earth did people nearly a thousand years ago build something so massive, so precise, and so breathtaking without modern machines? The ancient Khmer Empire, at its height between the 9th and 15th centuries, ruled much of Southeast Asia and left behind architectural marvels that continue to puzzle engineers, scientists, and historians today. We're talking about stone blocks weighing several tons each, transported across rivers, lifted to dizzying heights, and carved with such delicate precision that even modern laser tools would struggle to replicate their perfection. This wasn't just construction, it was technology. Ancient Khmer builders didn't have cranes, bulldozers, or hydraulic drills. Instead, they relied on an ingenious combination of engineering knowledge, human coordination, and natural science that many say was centuries ahead of its time. The Khmer Empire rose during a period when neighboring civilizations were also leaving their marks, China with its Great Wall, India with its temples, and Europe with its cathedrals. Yet Cambodia's ancient builders stood apart for one key reason scale. Angkor Wat, for example, is the largest religious monument in the world, covering more than 400 acres, larger than the Vatican, and far bigger than Egypt's Great Pyramid base. How did the Khmer manage such a feat? The secret begins at the source, the mountains themselves. The sandstone blocks used to construct Angkor Wat came from Nam Kulen, a mountain nearly 50 kilometers away. Imagine moving millions of these heavy stones through dense jungles, across rivers, and into an organized city project. It sounds impossible, but the Khmer achieved it with sheer genius. Recent studies suggest that they used a massive network of canals and waterways. These canals weren't random, they were engineered with precision, allowing stone blocks to be floated on rafts during the rainy season when water levels rose high enough to connect quarry to temple site. It's almost like the Khmer built highways of water centuries before industrialized shipping existed. Once at Angkor, the blocks had to be cut, lifted, and positioned. Without steel cranes or pulleys, how was this possible? Evidence shows that they employed ramps made of packed earth, stretching for hundreds of meters to gradually raise stone to higher levels. Combined with wooden scaffolding, lever systems, and sheer manpower, they lifted blocks weighing several tons into exact positions. Some ramps may have been temporary constructions, later dismantled once the temple was complete. What's even more fascinating is the precision of their work. The sandstone blocks at Angkor Wat fit together so tightly that even a thin blade cannot pass between them. No mortar, no modern adhesives, just expert carving and alignment. This shows that the Khmer stonemasons had an advanced understanding of geometry, balance, and architectural design. They planned not just vertically, but also horizontally, ensuring that the immense weight of the temples was distributed evenly so they could stand for centuries without collapsing. The alignment of Angkor Wat itself is another marvel. The entire temple complex is aligned with celestial bodies. On the equinox, for example, the sun rises directly over the central tower, illuminating the temple in a way that could not have been accidental. This required deep astronomical knowledge, the ability to calculate seasonal changes, and the skill to embed cosmic symbolism into stone. To the Khmer, their temples weren't just buildings, they were the universe in miniature, sacred reflections of heaven on earth. Another area where Khmer technology shines is water management. Angkor was not just a temple site, it was the heart of a thriving city, home to nearly a million people at its peak, making it one of the largest urban centers in the world at the time. Feeding, housing, and sustaining such a population required sophisticated systems. The Khmer engineered massive reservoirs called berets, along with canals and dikes that stretched for kilometers.
These were not just for drinking water, but also for rice cultivation, which was the empire's lifeline. Some of these reservoirs were so large that they functioned almost like inland seas. Recent satellite and LIDAR imaging have revealed the true scale of this network, an interconnected hydraulic city that controlled the flow of water with remarkable precision. In fact, many scholars argue that the Khmer Empire's rise and fall were tied directly to this water system. When it worked, it allowed surplus harvests, population growth, and grand temple construction. But when climate change brought prolonged droughts and floods, the system collapsed, taking the empire with it. But let's return to the mystery of moving stone. One fascinating theory suggests that elephants played a crucial role. The Khmer had domesticated elephants and used them as engines of strength. Elephants could haul heavy blocks across land, drag timber for scaffolding, and assist in construction projects. Combined with human labor, ramps, and rafts, the Chimera essentially created a natural workforce capable of reshaping landscapes. Still, elephants alone cannot explain the architectural genius of Angkor. To carve the intricate details, faces of Bayon, the epic bas-reliefs of Angkor Wat, and the elaborate Naga balustrades, artisans used iron chisels, hammers, and stone tools. The level of artistry suggests that these workers were not merely laborers, but highly skilled specialists, trained through generations. Each relief tells stories from Hindu epics, Buddhist teachings, and Khmer history, blending religion and power in stone. What's perhaps most astounding is the coordination required. Imagine tens of thousands of workers, craftsmen, and engineers working together on a single project that spanned decades. This required organization at a level similar to modern construction companies. Records suggest that the Khmer Empire had a centralized bureaucracy that managed resources, labor, and scheduling. Villages contributed manpower, officials oversaw logistics, and royal architects provided the grand designs. This was a civilization that moved mountains, literally, through social coordination as much as through technology. The Khmer didn't just build temples, they built symbols of power that communicated dominance. Angkor Wat, for instance, wasn't only a religious site, but also a political statement. Its sheer size and grandeur proclaimed the might of the Khmer kings. Every stone moved, every carving completed, and every alignment with the sun reinforced the divine authority of the ruler. These projects weren't just architecture, they were propaganda in stone. So, how exactly did they move mountains? They did it with ingenuity carving canals to float stones, building ramps to raise them, coordinating elephants and humans to haul them, and applying geometry and astronomy to place them with purpose. It was a combination of engineering, science, and spirituality, all rolled into one. And though centuries have passed, their technology continues to inspire awe. Even today, when you walk among the ruins of Angkor, you feel the weight of history pressing down on you, whispering the story of a people who achieved the impossible. The legacy of ancient Khmer technology goes beyond ruins. It reminds us of human potential when innovation, belief, and collective willpower align. The Khmer didn't see limits, they saw possibilities. With no modern machines, they built one of the greatest civilizations in human history, proving that true mountains can be moved not just with strength, but with vision.